This morning we are concluding our discussion about core values. Last Sunday when I was talking about core values, I talked about the importance of having them. They are the avenues in which a church's ministry, its growth, is built upon. Most churches hold the belief that our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And this, and this solid rock is the cornerstone on which the church itself stands upon. But it is the core values. It is the core values which line the hallways, give form and integrity to its ministries, define the means and practice of participation, and are the metrics to which we evaluate our effectiveness as a mission from where God calls us to serve. In other words, you can proclaim to believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You can claim to believe in the truth of God's love and plan as revealed in the Scriptures. But if there are no avenues which map the directions of this journey, track the learning and growth in our understanding of our relationship with God, how can we expect to assess and adjust the impact of our mission of striving to serve and striving to share the kingdom? Without the core values, what we become is people walking around in darkness of the to each other, proclaiming to be sharing God's love. We don't have anything as a body that works from within to send us out. The core values are the pathways. They help define the methods. They help produce the mediums in how we as a body of Christ will grow and change. But they are also how we as a body of Christ will live our faith so it impacts and transforms the world around us. But what often happens, as I alluded to last week, is you put forth a vision. You put forth a set of core values. And it becomes statements on a wall printed on stationery, posted on a sign, but the church does nothing to acclimate towards them, to embrace them, to personify them, to have them make manifest within the body itself. So there's a question that has to be asked. Why is it that clergy and lay leaders often fail to recognize their congregation's core values? In other words, what is their inability to see and understand the invisible power of core values that stem from the body? Well, there are at least four dominant factors. The first one is church leaders and staff members and congregation members will confuse their preferred values with the actual spiritual core values. In other words, this is how I see it, therefore that's the way it is. And everyone should believe that way. And that's not the case. You're coming with a preconceived notion and agenda and expecting the church body to conform to that. When if you read what the scriptures say, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and transform our minds and our actions to be more Christ-like, to reveal God in our lives each and every day. You cannot do that with preconceived notions with a preferred set of core values. It basically means you don't have to change. The second one is church leaders, staff members, and members confuse core values with other things which compromise current congregational personality. That's a really great way of saying we don't want to upset so-and-so. We don't want to upset this family. They're really strong supporters. We want to make sure they're happy. What is the core value in that moment? Is it about growing the kingdom? Being transformed by the truth? Coming alongside and helping them understand? Or is it about playing to the ego and the money because you want the church to stay open? The third one. It is confusing secular core value statements that will shape and motivate congregational behavior. Do you know what the biggest struggle in youth ministry right now that I hear from you, most youth pastors are today? 
It's understanding of morality and ethics. Any of you remember a television show called Friends? It's now in syndication on TBS. Do you recognize that as the culture of public broadcasting, a comedy series, that it was the first one that popularized the normalcy of pornography? As the show progressed, they talked about porn in more and more episodes, and basically treated it like it was an everyday normal occurrence to life. Not that it degraded people's bodies and led them into lives and situations of ill repute. Then, oh, you know, that was just an everyday thing. In talking to teenagers today about transgender, transgender issues, right and wrong, what it means to be part of a society, how we need to grow and change, how to make things better, are not brought together with a global idea or even a small group idea. It is all individualized. And when you sit there and have a discussion with them, you don't have a discussion where you have a dialogue of give and take. You have an argument. Or you have the teenager sit there and say, well, this is what I believe. Deal with it. You get defiance. Core values help rub those edges off and make avenues for true convergence of a body to come together and assimilate. And while I said there were four factors, I have nothing written here for number three. So I lie, there's only three. <laughs> Let me go into these a little more deep. When it comes to the preferred core values, what is often articulated is what we hope will happen within the congregation. It is a desire to strengthen congregational effectiveness and it disturbs the distinction between ideals which we are striving with vision and mission, mission statements to achieve with the core values, which, again, the deeply ingrained thought patterns. When we go with what we prefer, what we like, how do we open ourselves to God, for God to change us, to grow us, to become the creations we are called and gifted to be? When it comes to confusing core values with things of compromise, we're always giving into the influence of others. Words will be replaced from spiritual words. You'll see words like ethos and hopes and dreams and priorities and goals and vision and missions and plans and strategies, but those are never core values. Those are action words. They're not belief words. But we use them because they're horn tooting and they sound like we're doing something, but we don't let the values that God is putting in front of us shape our personalities. It basically falls back to, well, this is what we do as a congregation. And this is what we've always done as a congregation. Because it's what you know, it's what you prefer, and it stops any spiritual growth to go from where you are to where God wants you to be. And that's what your vision is. Where God wants you to be because we ain't there yet. It pulls us out of the mold that we've kind of adhered ourselves to. It breaks it. The core values takes us on the journey to become something new. One of my favorite themes in the transition period is out of 1 Corinthians, where the simple phrase is, with God, all things are made new. Which, they're supposed to be. But the idea of this newness being, okay, I accepted Jesus, I'm changed now, I'm going to go live my life. The changing and the growth doesn't stop until God calls us home with Him in paradise. We should be constantly striving to grow deeper, to understand, to be more effective, not excellent. And let me explain the difference between those two words and why I'm very particular in this language. People who strive for excellence are competing. They want to win, which means someone else is going to lose. If you look at the ministry, the witness, and the presence of Christ, he never went for excellence. He never tried to make it work. He won. In fact, 
he allowed himself to lose so everyone else could come out on top. That is a working definition of effectiveness. To use up everything you are, everything you have, so that others will benefit around you. It is to make sure that what you're doing has a positive impact with those that you encounter. Jesus did that all the time, uplifting and putting us to God in his ministry, giving himself on that cross, so dying so our sins would be washed away. That is effectiveness. It's an effective way of saving us. We sit there and say, yeah, but it's excellent too. The after effect is excellent. But the goal was to be effective. So we look to have effective ministries. And then we tend to we tend to kind of blur those value statements with what's going on in the world around us. When I worked with a congregation in Dearborn, Dearborn is Ford Country. I will pass the world headquarters, the glass house on the way to the church every day. And one day, sitting in a congregational meeting, talking about trying to understand how the church operates, a half a dozen executives from Ford stood up and said, well, we understand it because this is how we do things at Ford Motor Company. I said, really? Can you give me any Bible verses to back what you're doing? No, nope, we know that these strategies work. It's what grown for it from a small, small business to global wide scale. Oh. That church closed on New Year's Day. They kept putting the ways of the world, saying that that would move them, change them, grow them, make them better, instead of taking time to delve into what God was saying to them. Learning how to see Him. Learning how to trust Him. Learning how to follow Him. Instead, they just took what they already knew of the world and applied it to the church. And that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to value what God puts in front of us. Value His Son giving His life. Value the presence of the Holy Spirit. Value that God is in our lives. Value the truth in how to answer. All of life's questions and struggles are found in the Scriptures. But it's easier to just take what we learn in the world, what we've learned in college, what we've learned in our workplaces, because it's already familiar. It is an element of the culture that we have immersed ourselves in. Because it doesn't make us stand out. It doesn't make us be different. It doesn't make us beacons of light of God's grace. It just makes us part of the flow. Corporate value statements in congregations have at least five flaws. They more likely deal with the idea of spirit, ethos, and behavior descriptions rather than deeply ingrained thought, pattern, thought patterns. And it does not produce effective ministries. They are not directly related to theological rooted vision, mission, and core values. Has nothing to do with the time that you spent with working, wrestling, and discerning with God. They seldom influence behaviors of your church staff and your membership. The core values need to drive the staff. The staff doesn't drive the core values. They are difficult to measure. I have read so many corporate policies and core value statements and say, how in the heck do they assess? how they're growing and becoming better because their statements are just so nebulous and non-committal. And it makes it very difficult then to hold staff members, ministry people, own congregation folks accountable for being part of the body of Christ. There's this notion out there that saddens me in a lot of ways that if I come to church once in a while, if I take communion once in a while, if I put money in the offering plate once in a while, hey, I'm covered. Boy, oh boy, my question is, if you cracked the Bible, have you read any of the writings of Peter and Paul? Because they consistently say, if you're going to take on being a child of God, if you're going to accept who he is, then you need to change what your focus is and what you live out within yourself. You really need to replace all that stuff of the world with the stuff of God. And if you don't know how, then you need to get someplace that's going to teach you how to do that. 
And yes, it is a growing process. So you will unlearn some of the things that you learn as you acquire new knowledge. But everything that you hunger for, that you yearn for spiritually, hey, guess what? You'll get it. God made the first move by sending His Son to save us. Saying yes to Jesus isn't the second move. It's the catalytic moment. Walking in that faith, giving yourself to growing each and every day, that's the second move that we bring to the relationship. You ever had a friendship? Ever had a romantic relationship where you did all the work? The other person just enjoyed it and never gave anything back? In time, how did you feel? Empty? Discouraged? Angry? Embarrassed? Here's the beautiful thing about God. God won't. God can't. That's not as a nature. If you bring yourself to the relationship, you bring yourself and invest yourself into that equation, guess what? God will pour Himself into you more than you can believe or comprehend. The last thing is that church leaders tend to confuse printed vision statements and mission core values. This one is a little tricky to explain. I knew a congregation that its vision was seeking life, changing encounters with Jesus Christ. Okay, sounds good. But when the church went to state its values, its words to support this, they said accepting, transforming, equipping, and sending. Sounds great, doesn't it? There was no explanation of how those four posts would be applied. It was assumed that, well, everyone will know. Kind of along the lines of the, well, you know, back there. You've heard of God, yep, yeah, well, you know who he is, sure. You've heard of Jesus, yep, yeah, you know who he is, yeah. Well, you know. That person, well, you know about that. That need, well, you know about that. Boy, I can hear my grandmother flipping in her grave. Because every time one of her grandkids, and I was one of them, who would say, well, you know, she would say, not in a defiant way, or at least not to me, because I was the youngest and I was the cutest. Um, but I remember the older ones. No, I don't know. Would you explain that to me? Now, I didn't like it when she did it to me, but I loved it when she did it to my older cousins, because I would watch them go, I would, I would, I would, I would, I would. they couldn't do it. In other words, the thought process in which they were using to articulate themselves, they had not developed thoroughly their thesis. So it was just easier to say, well, you know, to make the congregation short and sweet, rather than to have a true dialogue to embrace. If you short cut the use of core values. You short life the church. Jesus taught us many things in the Bible. And to find what his core values definitely were is a real challenge. I have tried over and over again, and what I find is that every time I come to it, I see something differently. And part of that is just the beauty of the scriptures. Because our interpretation and application changes every time we come to it because we ourselves are growing and changing in a different place. If I've had a pretty serene day, I get a pretty serene and positive interpretation on the scriptures. If I've had a day that's just full of junk and yuckiness, I wrestle to find some tidbit of wisdom because I've got all this muck and mire that I've got to get out of my way. But most churches will sit there and say that they are here and value the verse is found in Matthew 28, 19-20. Can we put that up? There we go. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Beautiful, comforting, commanding, sending words. Here's the challenge of every church. 
How are we called to do that? The vision and the core values of which makes us unique in accomplishing this call. It comes from Matthew's testimonial account of God fulfilling his promise to save the world by sending the Messiah, the one who saves us from our own sins and depravity. And while we take those words that were up there just a moment ago, and no, you don't have to have them back. But as we take those words, we sit there and say, this is what Jesus is calling me to do. But that's not Jesus' first calling. That came at the end of Matthew, not at the beginning. Do you know what his first calling was? His first command to the people who said that they will follow him? And we'll take yes. Two words. He found Peter and Simon. Wow. Follow me. The first words Jesus spoke to command, to call, to embrace, the first move that he made was, follow me. I will teach you. I will show you. I will provide opportunities for you to experience what it means to, and these are the things that fulfill that great commission, how to, genuine, how to generate genuine community by becoming a child of God who is open and honest and accepting. I will teach you how to have a relationship with God where every day is a day of life in worship. I will give every person value in loving your neighbor as you love your child yourself. I will teach you how to become a disciple yourself and then go into the world and make disciples. I will take the compassion with God and show you how to lay it upon your heart and to use it for tangible acts of kindness, tangible acts of care, tangible service to others. I will show you how to become a believer in me, to become a missionary in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We like that great commission at the end, but it encapsulates, captures, personifies everything that happens in the previous 27 chapters. It's like reading the introduction to a book and then skipping to the last paragraph of the last page and thinking you understand the story. I saw a few friends in college try to do that for an English lit class. It didn't work. They ended up repeating it because they didn't understand the basic discipline, how to value that which God was putting in their lives. Now, for the disciples that Jesus called and said, follow me. Over the next three years, they who answered the call learned what it meant to follow Jesus and how to share the message of God's love with all people in this world. Because God wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants us to be one. He wants us to not merely embrace His glory and absorb His beauty and wonder like a sponge, but also like a sponge, kind of squeeze a little bit and let some of it pour out on others. I find that churches who are struggling today lack core values which transform the individuals who compromise the membership from being merely believers in Jesus. That is someone who believes in Jesus but does nothing about what they believe into becoming missionaries sent by Jesus to share God's love in a world that desperately needs to hear it 2,000 plus years from the time Jesus came into this world. Congregations who lack core values will then have ambiguous core values or will not embrace, think, or act within the core values that the church has when it, and it will experience then very poor Planning. Last minute, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? It will have a low morale because it is not charged and excited by the movement of the Spirit. It is saddened by the amount of fabric they see in their pews. It will have broken relationships. In other words, you will have people in your body who will say, I like everybody here. But if they talk to you privately, they'll say, but I don't trust so-and-so. 
Decision making will be very timid and will be very, very slow because no one feels the Spirit calling them so they don't want to take responsibility because they're afraid that the decision that they are pushing forward will be wrong and they will be chastised. There will be preoccupation with trivial matters. You know what trivial matters are? What color, what color paper plates we should buy? Don't laugh. I've heard, I've sat in meetings where they've argued about that for 20 minutes. Not here, in other places. Those crayons that we've had since 1945 are still just as good. We shouldn't get rid of them. Even though they're so rock hard, they don't put any color on paper. I've been part of those discussions. And I feel not only my toes curl up, but the hair on them. <laughs> oh, it's an excruciating of you. My favorite was what color wallpaper the women should put in the men's restroom. <laughs> and I finally sat there and went, I don't care what the color of the walls are when I need to relieve myself. They forgot I was at the meeting. They were so enwrapped in this debate. Those are trivial matters. The things that we need to spend our time on is what ministries are we doing that grow our body to send us out into the world? How, what, what's important to grow our effectiveness as a body of Christ to touch others? And the last one, the churches that have, that lack core values, is the so-called traditions keep you from moving forward. We can't do that because we've never done it that way. I understand that fear. I understand the comfort of where you've been. But vision and core values, as I have said once or twice before, I think, take you from where you are to where God wants you to be, where God is calling you to serve and to grow. So the question then becomes, how can a congregation transform into core values? How can they have them, implement them, and then assimilate into them? And most people will say, well, just do some teaching and share information, right? Wrong. Because most times with an educational program, you just kind of teach it and say, okay, everyone understands it. Let's go back to what we were doing before. Anyone here have a bathroom scale at home? And how many of you use it on a regular basis? And before the Daniel plan, how many of you were happy with the results? <laughs> you see a small hand over here. You were working on it before the Daniel plan. Yay! Like, hey. Anyone who stands on a bathroom scale understands that having knowledge and information how much your girth has grown or shrunk does not equate transformation. In other words, wow, I'm putting on a little more weight. I should change some of my diet. Maybe I should get off my tuchus and move a little more. But then you don't do it. You have the information right there in front of you. But you choose to ignore it. Because Increasing physical activity, changing diet, pulls you out of a personal tradition that you've had established for however many years you've had established. We can go to the doctor and they can tell us how to be healthy, but invariably we choose where we should cheat and where we shouldn't. Facts do not automatically produce positive behavioral results. Just because I teach you about core values doesn't necessarily mean that once we assess them, that you'll automatically acclimate towards them. Now, does this mean that congregational change is impossible? No, I don't believe so. I don't buy into that pessimistic, I'm going to give up confusion, conclusion. It would deny us the power of God's Spirit to bring change in the lives of individuals in the churches. We go forth into the world, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We serve in various missions, hoping to improve someone's lives. But we have to first and foremost be a beacon of light of that change of how God has changed us.
Growing up, I knew a gardener by the name of Dale Pigeon. And he grew prize winning rose bushes. Did you ever see Dale's garden, Gene? No. <clears throat> oh, he lives closer to me than you. <laughs> it was gorgeous. Now, he did not have overflowing rose bushes. He carefully trimmed and pruned and would work up the plants. So he'd get maybe a half a dozen blooms on a shrub instead of a dozen or more. He, would, he was very good at what he did, and like most gardeners of rose bushes, he could produce a new variety of rose by grafting new limbs into old stems. First time I ever saw a rose plant that had electrical tape on it, because he grafted a new young twig from a rose bush of a friend into the main stem of an old bush, and he said, now in a couple of years, that will be a beautiful flower and plant. And I kind of went, Mr. Pitch, and he kind of, he says, looks like crap now, I know. But with your dad being an electrician, he'd like the electrical tape the way that I wrapped it. And my dad did. But he knew that by this grafting process, it would strengthen the plant and produce new life, new health, new vitality. If you think about church growth and transformation and assimilating and activating to core values, supporting the vision, you are in a grafting process that strengthens the ministries that are essential to the congregation's overall spiritual growth, health, and effectiveness as a mission with the current generation of members that are sitting right here, right now, with the community that surrounds us on our property line and our homes, and at this particular time in history. If you looked at it as a means of competition, which I really don't like to do, you would see that the church is losing the battle right now, especially on the U.S. front. If we let ourselves grow and change, meaning open to what God wants us to do, take us to the places that are uncomfortable and yucky, make the change that we need to change, understanding that we may not see the long-term results but knowing that we are at the foundation and brought the future. This point of history, if we looked at a pivot, is a point of pivot for this congregation, for you as a body. The grafting process allows ourselves to transform into our core values, and it makes it much easier then for us as a body to support our vision statement, strengthen the effectiveness of our ministries. It brings a means of cognitive restructuring when we allow what the world has taught us to be transformed into what God is calling us, teaching us, embracing us, walking through, saving us because of His Son, Jesus the Christ. Our current vision statement reads, the people of God striving to share, striving to serve the kingdom of God. Jesus is the cornerstone of why we are here, that we are able to be here. The vision is the direction that we are called to go. But the core values becomes the maps we follow, the steps we climb, the paths we tread, in order to become a covenanted community who is committed to God and by another and each other by intentionally living as a disciple of Jesus who was sent to the world, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching, sharing, and living all the things that have been taught and commanded us to do by His Son. Well, one of my personal things about core values is it helps us to remember that in our daily walk, we are not alone, but our Lord, our Savior, our Master, and our friend Jesus <coughs> is with us each step of the way. Before I conclude, as I was driving in this morning, I had this thing resting in the And usually by driving in this morning, I like to 
be putting the final touches in things, you know, where I'm going to have to make a change here and there, and just kind of get into the zone to kind of do that pastoral thing that I have to do on a Sunday morning. Is that sun bothering you? No. Okay. Well, not you, but her. <laughs> She's sitting right in it. Like, it's like, I wish I had a baseball hat for you. <laughs> And as I was pulled over by a Troy police officer for speeding, he didn't give me a ticket. It gave me an extra 10 minutes where I was going, get to work, I'm get to church. All right, I'm going to have to wait for this guy. And I just sat there staring at the ceiling of my car, saying, oh, that could use a shampoo. And I'm not going to do it. And then my brain started to wander. And Matthew chapter 4 was just pounding it. This is the temptation. This is Matthew's account of Jesus' temptation. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and that concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that not a dash of your foot will fall against a stone. He won't even get a bruise. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world and their splendor and said to him, All of these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then my brain started spinning really fast. And the light went out of my head. Yes, I could sit there and say, well, you know, Jesus got through his ministry and everything because he was God's son. That was the divinity within him. But in looking at it in means of core values and asking what are the things that Jesus embraced in his own faith journey with his heavenly father to get him through a grueling three years. Three years of staying on point of being rejected. Three years of marching towards your own death trying to save the world when they're saying we don't want you. Taking stubborn folks, common folks, and and trying to show them a new, different way, a more effective way, a more joyous way, a lighter way of being one with God. That God is not off at a distance, but that God is here with us in this world. How did Jesus get through it? What did he embrace? What were his core values? One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He embraced his rabbinical teachings and the scriptures. Again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. God knows a whole lot more than I do. So I'm going to trust him to get me through this because I'm a bit overwhelmed right now. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Not on Sunday. I think these are the three tenets that Jesus held for his ministry. I think this is where his heart was focused. I think this is how his hands were able to heal. I think this is how his words were able to transform. I think this is where his wisdom came from. Because he allowed these things, these importance that helped him stay focused on God to fulfill God's calling he had for sending his only begotten son. What if we as a body can do the same thing with our core values that we discern? 
Let it be the game changer that it's supposed to be. Let it be the personal and congregational transformer that it's supposed to be. Let it be the avenue to take us out into the world to share the good news. It's more than filling the seats. It's more than having a balanced budget. It's more than growing our endowments. It's growing the kingdom. And that's the vision that we have discerned. To grow the kingdom of God. Striving in our own growth. Striving to be effective as we share what God means to us striving as we serve in Jesus' name. The core values keep us focused and on track. And I don't know about you, but as a pastor, I find that to be a very comforting thing. Because if you think that responsibility needs to be on the pastor's shoulders, you are overwhelming a pastor. Because they need some type of guidance to lead them and those core values will help.